Hi, dance friends. I'm Margaret Fuhrer, content director for the Dance Edit newsletter and podcast. And welcome to a special episode in partnership with McDonald Selznick Associates, the talent agency run by Julie McDonald and Tony Selznick, that represents some of the top dance talent in the entertainment industry. Since the fall television season is heating up, we thought it would be interesting to get an insider's perspective on the very specific challenges and opportunities that come with choreographing for TV. And we have two absolute titans of that scene with us for this episode. Marguerite Derrick's choreography resume includes The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Westworld, American Horror Story, The Dearly Departed Bunheads, to name just a few, as well as a slew of films, Austin Powers and Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and 10 Things I Hate About You among them. John Carafa is a former dancer with Twyla Tharp, who's since choreographed for The Gilded Age, Nashville, and Transparent, again to name just a few, as well as many films. He was also the choreographer for You're in Town on Broadway. So between them, these two artists have a wealth of knowledge about not just what it takes to be a successful television choreographer, but also what distinguishes TV work from choreography in other contexts. On a television set, choreographers have to wear many different hats. Derek's and Carafa do that with exceptional style. Here they are. Hi, Marguerite. Hi, John. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure. Me too. Great to yeah. be here. So for this episode, the wonderful Julie McDonald at MSA actually played matchmaker um, because both of you, of course, have deep experience in the TV dance world. So you're, you're ideal for this conversation in that sense. But Julie also said, oh, they'll give good interview together. So to get started, I was hoping you could talk a little about how you know each other and, and where your paths have intersected. I should do this, Marguerite, because you probably don't even remember. Um, we did a panel together a long time ago. At SAG. Yeah. And it's kind of the only time we've ever met in person. Yes. But I've always been a huge fan of hers. You know, Marguerite to me is kind of like the the prototype for the great TV, you know, choreographer. So I've always watched what she's done and and uh, been inspired by it. Well, I, too, have been a big fan of John's. So. No. <laughs> so that's it. It's been minimal. But, you know, like a lot of us in this field, we we don't get to talk to other people who do what we do. And so I've kind of made an effort with Marguerite and other people to sort of like try to bridge that gap. We, we meet a lot of directors. We talk to tons of directors. We know a lot of directors, but we really don't know each other. And it is, it's very meaningful. And it's kind of, it's kind of, it's a great thing to talk to somebody who has the same problems that you have and encounters the same difficulties. And so I've been making a little bit of an effort. On those lines. Just lovely because what I've found, you know, I've been in the business for such a long time, but what I'm really experiencing now more than ever actually is the, um, our community of choreographers, how supportive we are of one another. There's not that like, I'm against you, you're against me feeling at all. I think that we're all so blessed in being able to do what we love to do. And we've all like kind of carved, you know, our, our niche out and have all of our people that, that continue to hire us over and over and over. So the love of the community is always so touching to me. Like I, I really feel like I have a, a dance family and you know, John is, you know, I'm, I'm a little, no one would ever believe this if they heard me say it, but sometimes I'm a little shy to reach out. So I really um, did, you know, I was really happy when John reached out to me because um, I really, I just love our community. And so I try now to reach out to the younger generation coming up and, you know, give them whatever like diamonds and jewels that I can to help them to like spearhead their careers but it is a, it's a beautiful community that we're a part of. When you've been in it long enough, like Marguerite and I have, you start to realize that you're never really in competition with anybody else because yeah. we're all like, I look at stuff that Marguerite does like, oh yeah, I, I wouldn't, I could have done that. That's like not my thing. You know, we all can have our thing. We're all un so unique. I know it's interesting because so often the dance community is portrayed usually by people from the outside as super cutthroat and, you know, everybody's at each other, but the reality is that the vast majority of it, these everyone is so generous. There's a lot of generosity. I feel like the vibe I get more is we're inspired by one another. 
you know, like when I see the work, I'm so like, I'm always just so in awe of the work that I'm seeing my, you know, fellow choreographers doing out there that I'm just completely inspired. You know, I don't feel competitive at all. I feel absolutely inspired. And I think there's just enough to go around. You know, there are, I'm sure, I, like, I can't imagine, I don't know how you feel about this, John, but I couldn't imagine starting out as a choreographer in this day and age. It's just so different. In my classes with the younger dancers, I talk about the Rolodex of having all of those, you know, the people that that you've met along the way that continue to hire you, you know, over and over. And I like I wonder, like, wow, like I, I remember building that with Julie, like she I, I was started my career with her and we really built up all of those clients that I still work for. I, I know it's just so different now. I guess we would be on YouTube, John. I don't know. I don't, it's just so different. It's just really so different now. It's like we got yeah. shot in a different way back in the day. Yeah, I've been watching that. Like how, I don't know. There's that, you know, that guy Slavic. Have you ever seen It's Slavic on Instagram? No. Like, there's a guy and he's got a very unique style and, a, and he does sort of the same thing every time. But I feel like, if I was starting out today, I might try to do some kind of Instagram presence where I was just really putting out something original. Like, you know, like if, if nobody, nobody knew Ryan Heffington right now, if he was just starting out and he just started putting out, cause he has a real like vibe on his Instagram profile. Like maybe that would be the way to go about it. But I don't, Marguerite, I mean, I don't know you're beginning. I was like a, a professional dancer for 10 years. So that's how I started with Twyla. So, yeah. I mean, and I had to start all over again when I started filming TV. I don't know what you would do. Now. Yeah, I yeah I I was a I was a fame dancer with Debbie Allen, so that's how I got oh, my start. Well, I started in TV, and I really you know she was uh she was my my mentor, so I got to really like you know I was so inspired as a dancer, but also as a choreographer and a director, like watching her do her thing, really like guided my path and my passion to want to I think. I started choreographing a year after I left fame. So it was just like, I'm, yeah. Hey, I did the dancing thing. I'm, I'm ready to do what my mentor does. You know, sure. uh, I don't know. Like I, you know, Instagram is cute and fun to me, but I just can't, I, I never can wrap my mind around, Oh, that's a way to get a job. It's just, it's just not part of how I grew up. So it's not something that I, respond right. to I would never ever 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 and I tell that like I do this when I do Q and A's all the time I would never hire a dancer from Instagram oh. there's no way like that that would not be enough for me I would need to get them in a room see right. how they do my stuff as opposed to the stuff they're putting out there so I wonder you know in these in the television world like because I you know I work with so many that we both do the directors and producers out there. I can't imagine them looking at Instagram and feeling like that was enough to hire them for a TV show because, you know, what is it besides choreography that we do on a TV show? It is a lot. So these cute little steps and this really, all of that is wonderful, but that's just a, one part of what we do. Maybe I would take an interview with someone that I saw like a cool piece on Instagram, but I would never hire them directly from that. I would want to know that they could run a department and they have that TV yeah. experience. Yeah. I know it is interesting though, because Instagram and the other various forms of social media are now totally baked into the way this entire, an entire generation thinks about dance. It is, it is inseparable. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that affects like what the creative process looks like going forward. But from what I've heard, it sounds like a lot of younger dancers, their Instagram grid is their resume it's not necessarily what gets yeah. them the job but it's kind of what gets them the audition you know it gets them in the door well i've got i've used instagram because i do a lot of zoom auditions too and after i've got met somebody or zoom with them or and then gone back and looked at their instagram just to get a feel for who they are yeah so, that makes yeah. sense john but you want to see how they handle your choreography first yeah because I, i've i've seen some dancers even in class back in the day I remember I was uh, choreographing a Broadway show and I needed, you know, I needed some dancers and I, I was going up to teach a master class uh, um, at the edge mm -hmm. and I walked by this room and there was this girl and she was in a class and this girl was, it, it was blowing my mind. Like she was so stunning. It was a, mm -hmm. a different style from what I do. And I invited her to come to my audition. I know. 
her out of the room in five minutes. Like she was, it was like, I couldn't believe it was the same girl, but yeah. she couldn't, she didn't have a center. She was doing yeah. that temporary stuff where she, she couldn't control the work. So yeah. there was no way. So it's, you know, I always need to see somebody do what I need them to do for the job. Yeah. And then maybe like you, John, I'll go back and, and look at their pretty. Yeah. Good As a reference movie. afterward. Yeah. I guess I always wanted, like, I, you know, as much as I love television, because I do, and I work so much in that, that, that area, I always wanted to do everything. And so, and, and not just in like Broadway, film, TV, live, beyond that, every style of dance. I never wanted to have a thumbprint where it, like you knew what my style was. Yeah, I wanted for me. people to go, oh, it's Marguerite, it's John. They could do anything like that was kind of I remember Julie back in the day when we first started out, she used to tell the producers that would call Marguerite can make a rock dance like, you know, it was just like, you know, I never walk into a job, especially when we're working with actors. I have things prepared for possibilities, but I never go in with my mind made up like this is what it's going to be. It's not till you get in the room and you see how those people move, you know, so I'm not trying to force my sense of style and the way I move on, on an actor, like that would scare the shit out of them if I ever did that. <laughs> we could yeah. probably, the two of us could do a, a whole 10 podcast series about working with actors. Cause that's, Absolutely. that's a big part of what we both do. Let's talk about that. Cause I mean, of course, many actors are gifted movers and you've both worked with some great dancers, but not all TV actors have extensive dance training. So how do you go about creating choreography that both caters to and then also stretches the abilities of artists who are maybe less dance inclined? Well, just as an intro to that, I'll say along the lines of Marguerite, my idea when I started choreographing was I did also did not want people to look at my style as a, a specific, you know, like, oh, he does these 10 steps. But I thought, well, what if my choreographic career was like an actor's career? And I'm trying on different roles um, as a choreographer. So I'm doing a period thing and a, an actor doing a period thing would research it and get into that mode. And so I sort of look at my job like I think an actor would look at their job sort of trying on the period, the style, the mannerisms of the, you know, of the of, of whatever, whatever you're working on. Absolutely. Like uh, you do the research of like, you know, I'm going to talk about Mike Myers for a second because we did so many films together and TV specials. But, you know, Mike uh, on an interview uh, said one of the things I love that he said about me um, was Marguerite walks into a room with a thousand ideas attached to none. So like John said, like, you know, with Austin Powers, it was set in the 60s. So, you know, you know, and Maisel is in the 50s now going into the 60s. You do the research of that era you know, so you you know the style and then you go in with ideas, but it, like you don't attach yourself to anything. And when I, you know, I see some of these young choreographers, there's no way that they're not going to, the way I see the work, there's no way they're going to walk in and not be attached to it. They're going to try to force that on an actor. And the biggest thing for me with working with actors and when I worked on Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Angie was very, Angelina was very, they were nervous about dancing. It's get it's just walking in the room and knowing a way to make your your actors comfortable and making them feel like they are the best dancers in the world. And and once they drop the fear, then they allow themselves to explore with you and find the movement that works for them. And that is like for me, I love teaching dance, and that's the thing that I learned along the way. I'm a great teacher. And I, I always, I, I joke and say, when I walk into a room with an actors, it's an actors, it's like me going into a, a children's class, you know, just trying to make them comfortable and fearless. And um, I, I found there's really no actor that I have not been able to um, choreograph and get, get to moving and loving it. I mean, uh, after a, a little while of Brad and Angie, they were loving it and they were wonderful together. It was just getting past the fear, going in with some ideas, not trying to force something. I'll I'll work with an actor, and after five minutes, if something's not working, I'll, I'll like be like, let's throw that out, let's let's move on, let's try something else. So you have to have your pockets full because you know you might have to try 10, 20 things before the right thing comes. And I don't know if that's the same for you, John. 
Oh, you know, it's exactly, you know, this is what's fun about talking to somebody else who does what you do because it's the exact same thing. Yeah. My, my, um, my angle into it was, you know, when I started dancing as a kid, I started taking tap and jazz when I was like 11 or 12, but it was so uncool for a boy, you know, Italian American, blue collar family, blue collar neighborhood. So uncool for a boy to be studying dance that I did it in another town. Uh, uh -huh. I went to the next town over and nobody really did knew that I did it. And wow. so when it, even to this day, when I'm when I like at a wedding or even demonstrating for dancers, there's a, a bit of like ripping off the skin and showing my my private, my my like secret, you know. Yeah. And so I feel like because I already feel that I feel like actors can I can kind of get how vulnerable they feel. Wow. when they're having to expose themselves because dance is so revealing of of a person you can't sort of hide hide behind it so yeah. um i approach it the same way you do marguerite and i also talk to dance to the actors like i approach it from story which I'm, i know you could do another we could do a podcast number two yes. on actors and, and telling stories because the hardest i think the hardest thing to do as a choreographer is to tell a story within the piece that you're creating and 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 actors will feel if they understand the, the story that they're telling the character and why they're doing it, then they can associate it to what they do when they do di uh, dialogue scenes and blocking. Sometimes I try to, you know, I, first of all, the tricks of the trade, you do what they are good at. You use their skills mm -hmm. and you bring out everybody's inner dancer. Everybody loves to dance. Like everybody loves to go crazy on some level. And it's just the freedom to let give yourself permission to do that, that you have to find the place in your relationship with that actor to do that. So they don't, you know, feel judged. And a lot of the times, you know, like they like when I work with Connie Britton, she would always kick the directors out and say, like, she just wants to be there with me alone. And the uh, one of the other tricks that I use, here's a good one, Margie. I don't know if you ever do this, but I tell actors, if you can say it, you can do it. And I make them say the choreography like. Oh, never done uh, right, left, step, step, turn to, and because they m actors work so much on memorizing uh, linear dialogue and stuff like that, I often find like that part of their brain will teach it to their feet, and once they can sort of do it verbally, then then they can start to do it. Uh, then they can do it with their body. It's like, oh yeah, now I can do it. You know. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Um. Yeah. So, storytelling. I, you know, the whole second podcast that we could do, but the idea of storytelling for the television screen is a particular challenge, a really specific challenge. And I think a lot of people, even those who are really well-versed in the workings of the concert dance world, don't understand just how different choreographing for television is from, from working in that world. Can you talk a little about what sets TV dance apart from dance for the stage and even dance for film, since you've both done extensive work in all of the above? I think the biggest difference for me is time. TV is so fast. You know, when you work in, in, in the theater, you get weeks to create and then change. You know, even in films, if you're working on a big film, there's, there's a lot more time and preparation. Once you're on a TV show, it moves like that. So it's, you, you really, you know, it, it, it's like a machine. You're just moving so quickly. So, um, you know, I know like on Maisel, a lot of times we get to set and I, and I always, I warn the dancers, but I try not to do it with, with the actors, but I warn them as well. Like when we get there, <laughs> cause it's a pas de deux constantly with the camera, when we're working on Maisel, everything's choreographed with camera. I'm like, just be everything you're learning today, be prepared to change it. So for me, it's the, the, the fast pace of television. And if you're on a series where you're like, as a choreographer where every episode has dance in it, you're like shooting one while you're prepping the other. And so it's just, it just moves so fast. And, you know, from the concert person to TV, is it what, what we have is we have the ability to dance with the camera. Whereas in, on, a, on a stage, lighting and focus helps to do what the camera does on film. Um, so those are my biggest, the two different things that I kind of feel with TV. Such a big part of our job is translating the world of dance to the world of the film crew and the director and the cinematographer and helping those people understand. So I'm guessing that like I'm feeling that you have to be a virtuoso in 
that communication. You know, you have to be able to help people from both sides. You, you become the sort of conduit between both sides, you know. But the but you know, the big thing for me is the same as, as for Marguerite. Like when I work on Broadway, I want the audience to look over here. I have to stage it so they look over here. But in film and TV, it's just, you know, it's shot that way. You know, we, we, and I don't know, I, you know, like I, st now I film everything, all rehearsals and give them to the DP. And I also, sometimes I even edit, edit the rehearsal. I'll, I'll film it and, sh and get create shots and edit it. Cause some people like that. Some people don't like that, yeah. but, um, but it's about helping them understand. Um, you don't want to, you want to be on their, on this part of the dance here. You want to be on their feet here. You want to be on, you want to be down the line here because this, this is going to be really cool. And, a lot all that's communication with the with the people who know the language of film and very often like i work on a lot of shows that i haven't worked with them people before that happens often and so they can either be overly reverent and not want to say anything to you about changing the dance or they could just be so clueless about you know and they just need you to help them understand like what they can change and how dance is malleable or there's just a lot of communication that has to happen between the world of dance and the world of filmmaking. You have to know filmmaking as a as a film choreographer. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is getting into something that you both brought up earlier, which is just how many roles television choreographers are playing on set and behind the scenes. Can you talk a little about some of the components of your job, you know, in addition to having a knowledge of film editing, what else do you need to do that's going beyond what's sort of, you know, quote unquote, traditionally expected of a choreographer? Well, we're, we're like a second director on the set for sure. And we are definitely producers. You know, some jobs you get the script and it says, tells you what the dance is, but a lot of times we're going in and we're creating what the, what the scene might be. Like for instance, last year on Maisel, when we were in the burlesque club, coming up with ideas of what the different numbers might look like. So we're producing, we're directing. And sometimes if you're running a department, like on a TV show, I remember on Fame LA, I was doing mandates. I was doing budgets. I knew that I had a certain amount of mandates. So if I don't use, if I use less dancers on this show, I can roll it over to the next show. So, okay, I did nine mandates, which is nine contracts for a dancer, a daily contract. I can save those 10 because I know what's coming up is much larger. And so I really like, I got, and I love numbers and I never knew it until I did that show, how much I was good at it and loved crunching the numbers and saving my mandates and coming in under budget. And I, I'll never forget when I did the, the remake of the, the movie Fame, um, one of my students was a director and hired me. He told the producers that I needed like four weeks of rehearsal before we started shooting. And I was like, okay. And then I, I was walking into a, 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 um, a premiere of something and my phone rang and it was one of the producers in the, in the UPM, the line producer in an office freaking out at how much it was going to cost really with that many dancers for four weeks. And I like, I, I kind of giggled. I sat down. I said, well, I could do the first week, which is two assistants in a room. And then the second week I'm going to bring in five dancers as a skeleton crew. And then, by, and so I cut the budget from what they, what they had in their mind with those four weeks, I cut it in less than half, like maybe like, like a fourth of what they thought it was going to be. And I remember on um, the first day of shooting, one of the producers that I was on the phone with, he goes, you knew all along. And I just laughed and I said, yeah, I knew. Like, I know how to do this. Like the director was like giving me a, a major gift by saying she needs this, give it to her. But I always, as a choreographer, like I, I work with all of the departments. So I always try to make the producers happy too. And that's, there's our relationships, right, John? Yeah. Those things is what creates longevity for us in this business is that knowledge and knowing how to do that. To do this job, you kind of have to take pleasure in, the kind of things Marguerite's talking about, like where you figure out something that helps the production or you yeah. you support the director, like you go to the costume department and fix something that you know was going to mess up the whole day and the director doesn't necessarily even know it. But you, ha you kind of, as a choreographer, I think it's built in our DNA to be that support person, to want to make everything go well. And there's something in our DNA that we just get great pleasure from being 
that right hand person to the director and executing their vision and to the writer too, you know, like, cause sometimes like Marguerite said, there'll be something in a script just as they dance, but you know, you come up with an idea that wasn't necessarily anything that they, they could have written. And I think, you know, John, and I think, you know, you and I know all of this through our experience and time. And that's why we have that Rolodex of people mm -hmm. that continue to call us over and over again, because they, that once they have that, yeah. Once they have that, they don't right. want to go back to somebody just because they have cool moves on Instagram. Right, right. And it's very, it can be intimidating for some directors to let go of some of that control. Oh, yeah. And that's why after the second or third time you've worked with somebody, yeah. they get more comfortable. It's like, oh, great, I can just have you do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, on, on TV sets in particular, the relationship between the choreographer and the director seems critical i mean that that you have symbiosis happening there well interestingly yeah interestingly on tv you know it's rotating directors yeah so you get a ro relationship with the showrunner that's but right then you want it that director comes in and he doesn't know any of the crew right. uh, or she doesn't know any of the crew they come in and it's always great to sort of be that person who you know i take them aside and say look i'm here to help you let me know if there's anything i can i can tell you about this situation the crew whatever and just sort of help them through this this new um, you know world that they're navigating in. Right, they're not besides the crew, even with the actors. Right, and really, like you know, because the choreographer is there for every episode. We really like we know the, the what the world is and why this person might be doing this in this episode. You know, where uh, uh you know the, the rotating directors that come in sometimes they don't know the depth of the show and I've seen a lot of actors get very frustrated by that and like John you know we are there like to welcome them and to let them know hey we're here for you the choreographer is the glue yeah. I'm re revealing my own blind spots here yeah it's rotating directors right of course um well and the fact that television choreographers that all entertainment industry choreographers have their hands in so many aspects of the show or of the film makes it even more frustrating and even more bizarre that they often don't receive the credit or the recognition or the compensation that they deserve. And well, I'm wondering what you think as people inside of this industry, what do you think is at the root of that issue? I'm going to speak first, John. I have to I almost have to step aside on this one because from the very beginning of my career and Julie McDonald is such an advocate for, you know, compensation and credit. I've always gotten that. I've always gotten it. So, um, and I've turned down, I remember I was doing a, a big movie with Jodie Foster and I wanted not only credit, but I wanted the front title credit. You know, and I wanted my name on the posters, like which I've gotten on quite a few movies. And I was willing to say no. And um, because I, I, I always felt like I gave my representation the power of no. The power to say thank you, but no thank you, because it was so important to me. I would I would negotiate more on money than I would on credit. Like that was that's just too important to me. Um, I do support, you know, the the community coming together and wanting to um, unionize or find a way to make it so there's never a discussion. But for me, on every job, there's never a discussion. I was at a different agency for a second, um, and I Maisel started, and um, you know, it, it's not a dance show, but as the seasons went on, more Amy loves dance so much more and more dance came, you know? So um, she called me from the editing bay and she goes, lovely, oh my God. I just I just saw that you don't have a, a single title card. I'm fixing it now, oh my God, how did that happen? Um, so she fixed it. The creator of the show made sure that I had a full title card. That was like, she, she saved the day there. You know, we do have relationships and we do have the power of no. Um, it'll be nice one day where we don't have to think about that. Yeah, yeah I'm in the same boat as, as Marguerite. It's really about what I want to stand up for and get for myself. And so the effort to sort of unionize or support choreographers to get health insurance and all, that's really for like 
future generations. Right. It's still like down the line. Yeah, it is. It's it's fighting for the future generations. There are some things we can do to help people. Yeah, I, I think so too, John. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I guess what I was wondering about more, because of course the two of you have been very proactive and responsible about advocating for yourselves and finding good representation that will help you do that work. But I'm wondering why the issue exists in the first place, because if you are working in almost any other corner of the entertainment industry, it's never a question. It is just automatic. Why is it that choreo- for choreographers, credit? for credit, for like base rates, um, all those health insurance, right. all those kinds of things that most people working on a set are guaranteed from the get go? Honestly, I mean, I could tell you it just didn't happen early in the industry's formation when in the 30s and 40s when the DGA formed and when. And so since it didn't happen then, it's kind of too late now. It's to, the choreographers would have no sort of clout to go to the AMPTP, you know, the television producers and try to negotiate a contract. You'd be like, forget it. You know, like Yahtzee barely has that power. So. I was uh, I was a dancer on Fame in the early '80s, and we were extras. There was right. no SAG for dancers; it was SEG. I and, remember that. I remember that. And I remember uh, second the the maybe the first season I got there, we went on strike the dancers because we wanted SAG contracts. Yeah. And um, they held an audition the next day, and like thousands of pe- dancers showed up to take our jobs. Yeah. So they, like MGM was like saying, okay. And it wasn't until I was choreographing the TV show Fame LA in 1997 became the first show to give dancers sad contracts. So from early, like 82 or 83 to 97 before the dancers got that contract. Um, so it was it was a long fight. I fought that fight. I fought that fight. So I'm leaving this fight. I, like I'm I'm supporting them. <laughs> I'm saying okay, here your your time to hold up the big sign. Yeah. Me too. Um, but Marjorie, yeah. would you would you say that there's something in the psychology of a dancer and that and also as a choreographer because we were dancers that just is willing to just wants to work. And it's okay. You don't have to pay me. And you know what I mean? That we're so, like I said, there's something in our, in our, in our DNA that just is, is, is about support. You know what I mean? Do you think that maybe that was part of it early on? Uh, yeah, maybe John. Yeah. Because we, just, we just were so passionate and just wanted to work so bad. Yeah. I know we're coming to the end of our scheduled time, but I wanted to sort of bring things back to a, a happier place, I guess. <laughs> You've you've both worked with so many huge stars on so many big sets. What are some of your favorite anecdotes, good stories, bad stories, funny stories, learning experience stories um, from the set? This is hard because I'm going to hang up from the Zoom and have 10 stories for you, I know. but <laughs> I know. I feel the same way, John. I, yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, I, I have one. I find it funny. I don't know how funny it is. I was working on Spider-Man 3 with Sam Raimi <clears throat> and I was uh, initially brought in to create a couple of numbers for Tobey Maguire in the film. And the way they were written in the script, they were kind of like B-boy numbers. And um, Tobey wasn't feeling it at all. Like he, he didn't even want to dance because like the spinning on the head and all of that stuff, he was just like, he couldn't even wrap his mind around it. And my first day I walked in <clears throat> and Toby was all negative on the couch and Sam looked at me and he goes, well, w- what are you going to do? You're just a girl. <laughs> so I was like, Oh my God, I have my mountain to climb here. And then it came time to finally go to Toby McGuire's house. And I whipped a little Fred Astaire on him and Oh my God, he loved it. Like at Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire moves. That was Toby's jam and um so I completely flipped it around now I'm I that's like a month or a month month and a half down the line of creation and now I flip it on his head everybody loves it Sam's on board everybody's on board um and the last day Sam Raimi came riding up on a girl's bicycle came up to the, the soundstage and rode up on the girl's bicycle. And I said, Sam, 
you're riding a girl's bicycle. You know, I just wanted to get him back for that. What are you going to do? You're a girl thing. And he just looked uh, at me. He looked at me at first and then he started to laugh. You know, it was a lot of fun. I can follow that. That's an amazing <laughs> story. Um, you gave me time to think of things. Now I thought of three little things. Like all the stories have the same theme, I think, or, or would have the same thing for us, which is kind of like overcoming some yeah. um some sense that we weren't going to be able to do it or overcoming an, an actor's fear or obstacles. Yeah. Um, I did Urin Town on Broadway. There were no dancers in that show or Into the Woods. The shows I won Tony nominations for, not a dancer in them. But I felt like my the, the thing I would do is convince them that they were the greatest dance group on Broadway at that time and get them together it's like you guys don't realize like other dancers are talking about you oh, like, no. with amazing dance they've yeah. seen and i had them doing these like crazy leaps and things believing that they were just like you know doing them brilliantly and the audience was like losing their minds because it was so funny to watch people yeah. so passionately executing things that were you know they weren't really executing but they were with so much commitment commitment is the key of comedy Ah, okay. It really okay. is. Getting an actor to be committed is and, and really go for it. Like I never try to make actors look bad. I like I, I want them to do it the best that they can because that commitment is what is hilarious. They have to believe they yeah. believe themselves. And my film story is I did uh, something borrowed with Kate Hudson and Jennifer Goodwin. So I hired two dancers who would be their stand-ins mm -hmm. for the shoot. And so we get to the shoot. This is a uh, push it. We did push it in something bar. So like, and and I, I hope Jennifer doesn't, I hope, I hope they don't take this personally and tell this story, but, and I said, well, why don't we do this? Let me have the, the stand-ins do it first. So you guys can just see, and you could block it for camera and everything. And these two dancers just ripped into this, that dance, just like killed it. And I saw Kate and Jennifer look at each other and this sort of sense of competition rose up in their eyes and like, we're going to, we're going to nail this dance. And they, they did that thing where they they went aside, they went into the corner and they started working and practicing it. And and it ended up being, you know, great on camera. But it took sort of a, a little bit of um, psychology to get them there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a normal day on the job for us, John. <laughs> exactly. Tricks, you know, whatever, whatever works. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Maybe I'll bleep out some names in that story because I think Jennifer is a huge fan of this podcast. So she is just kidding. Well, you know. <laughs> No, no. But it is funny because Jennifer messaged me recently and she said, do you have any rehearsal footage of that dance? Because it's what everybody asks me about. <laughs> everybody wants it. Everybody talks about that dance all the time of everything in my career. And I just think it's so funny because the process we went through to get there is just, you know, was so with twisty. That's so funny. Um, yeah. Actually, I lied. That wasn't quite my last question. My last question is I'm hoping you can continue to give advice on this since you already started advice for um dancers and choreographers who are aspiring to careers like yours don't do it don't, don't do it there's too many of us already yeah <laughs> great job i have i have a couple of things that i just think no aspiring choreographer should do anything until they assist one if not several working choreographers i i bring all of my assistants to all the meetings with me i involve them in the whole process and they have to teach. Those are two things. I'm like, you, you should not even attempt um, to, to become a choreographer without those two things are an absolute must, hands down. Um, I encourage people to be amazing dancers too. Just oh, to really, yeah. I feel like there's, you know, when I was dancing, I danced with Twilight Art for 10 years. And, you know, I took class six days a week. On, I wouldn't take class on Sunday. I would come back on Monday and feel like, oh, I lost everything. Like that's how much a class every day meant to me. And so I'm always encouraging people like to just get your technique, like just be amazing dancers, yeah. learn different styles and, and stuff, of course, but just be a great dancer. There's so much focus on like, you know, um, it's type or it's, you know, there's it's out of your control. I'm like, no, it's not out of your control. Like be an amazing, be so good that they can't turn you down. Yeah. Um, and that will naturally lead you into the next, you know, phases. Yeah. Yeah, what's the Baryshnikov quote about you miss class for one day, you know it, two days, your teacher knows it, three days, the audience uh -huh. knows it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Marguerite and John, thank you so much for, for taking the time today and sharing your, your gems and jewels. Thank you. Thanks.
episode one of 10, because, you know, we yes. just got into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Another big thank you to John and Marguerite. In the show notes, we have links to their websites and to their social pages. I know we just heard they're not super duper Instagrammy people, but they do give us fun behind the scenes looks at the projects they're working on. So definitely worth a follow. We also have a link to the MSA agency website so you can find out more about the work they're doing to advocate for dance artists. And finally, I wanted to remind you all that the Dance Edit also has a daily newsletter, a one minute read that'll get you up to speed on all the stories moving the dance world. It is free and very handy, so I hope you'll sign up for that at thedanceedit.com. Thanks to all of you for listening. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. <laughs> <laughs>